terrified. Listen to me, Republicans. Listen. You are the people in history they warned us about. They warned us about people like you. Pay attention. We're losing our democracy. Wake up. Wake up. Please, wake up. Upstairs at Fralix, show 303, real one. The thing about it is, Ad Astra and Cowboys vs. Aliens are my now, my benchmarks for very low standards with big budget movies filled with a lot of promise. Not even Battlefielder? Um, no, no. I, I, I... I to be honest, I never watched Battlefield Earth. Right. I, tr- I tried to read the book because I wanted Dude, to know what L. Ron Hubbard was trying to say. <laughs> just give the movie a try. I mean, I, I enjoy it. Not, I think the movie's incomprehensible garbage, but I like watching it because it's fucking 20 or $40 million wasted, and it's a fucking awesome piece of shit. Incomprehensible garbage, again, ad astra. <laughs> I mean, Cowboys vs. Aliens had a story, I guess, and it made more sense, so maybe it was a little better than ad astra, but ad astra, oh my god. Oh, so you're gonna, oh, you're gonna love this. So I, uh, I showed my buddy Face the Music, we finally caught a stream of it. Yep. Dude, he cried at the end. Oh, really? He cried. Did you like see? A bi- like a bitch. Did you see that, um, that Keanu Reeves was nominated for a People's Choice Award for the movie? Really? Yeah, yeah. And I hope he wins. I don't know why Keanu, because I think really Alex was the standout and also the daughters. But uh, I guess they wanted to play it safe. But that's uh, that's really good. It's good to hear. I could watch it again. Actually, uh, uh, Broman wants to show all three movies if we can find. Maybe in a couple of months they'll have like a three pack or something on Blu-ray or something like that. Because I'm all there about is a, physical There media. is a three-pack coming out. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, That's good to know. All right. So we are here. We are back. We are live. We are in. And we're going to talk about Don Coscarelli. Just watched the movies over the weekend. I rewatched the movies over the weekend. Phantasm and Bubba Hotep. Now, Don Coscarelli is a Libyan-born filmmaker. He's from Libya, but I'm assuming. But that last name, he's got to be Italiano. You know what I'm saying? Oh, of course. Italiano I mean, it's, it's kind of like Bruce Willis. He's born in Germany, but... You know, but he's here. a Philly boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and Don Coscarelli has this distinction of creating uh, three iconic pieces of horror cinema over the course of three decades. Phantasm in 1979, you have Beastmaster in 1983, and you have Bubba Hotep in 2002. Unfortunately, the 90s weren't too kind. I guess not. Well, he did, he did do the Phantasm sequels, but I only know Phantasm 2 got a major motion picture release because I remember seeing commercials on television for it. And then it flopped. With a music video, too. There was a music <laughs> video attached to Phantasm 2. Universal wanted their uh, their franchise. You know, like every studio had a franchise at that point. Yeah, yeah. You know, like how New Line had Freddy, Paramount had Jason. And this know? was and before now, The Mummy. And then now they got, that. well, United Artists has Chucky. We need our own thing here. So that's where they said, let's do Phantasm. And then it underperformed because they didn't. You know, think about it too hard. I, and then, well, the, yeah, then maybe the they didn't market right. Chuck. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But the, but Phantasm was a movie that cost like three hundred thousand dollars, which was around like what you know Halloween cost back a year before. Mm. Made twelve million dollars. It was an enormous hit on that very on that very little budget. No, nothing else that Coscarelli did even approached that. Uh, Beastmaster wasn't even a huge hit when it came out. It became a hit on rotation and cable because it was on cable constantly. It was on TBS and HBO consistently. Oh, TBS too. Yeah, they totally. And then that inspired sequels too. So it's, they were really kind of catering to a fringe, like cult thing with, with, with the movies that he made. And even then after Bubba Hotep, which again, didn't really make any money, but it was a big cult hit because it was Coscarelli and Bruce Campbell. Uh, they were talking about doing a sequel to Bubba Hotep. How could you do it without Bruce? Well, you'd have to have Bruce. It was Bruce Campbell was trying to get the ball rolling on it, but again, nobody wants to invest in it for some reason. But again, the the movie is pretty definitive in as far as how it ends. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't want to spoil it, but oh, my God. We I, will talk about it. I, I do yeah, have we'll to tell you, before we even launch into Phantasm, I forgot how depressing 
Bubba Ho Tub was when I because I when I first saw it, I thought it was great, it was wonderful and everything. But then I watched it again, I was like, Jesus, this is depressing because it's it's all about old people and all that. But we'll get to that when we get to it. Okay. But for now, we got Phantasm, which uh, it just incredible, really, when you when you consider that it was made by by a bunch of amateurs, really. Literally, this twenty, I think it was like twenty three or twenty four year old kid, and, he, and who and who already had two movies under his belt. I mean, you, you know the whole the Jim the World's Greatest. It was completely done independently, but it was his parents. Universal picked it up in seventy six. I think it was nineteen when he signed the deal. Because unlike a lot of other amateur filmmakers. He made it look good. He made it look professional. And even if you look at some of the effects in Phantasm, they're actually pretty impressive even by today's standards. So basically we could say, as kind of an illusion, Don Coscarelli is like the Eddie Van Halen of horror filmmakers. Yeah, I guess he, he has like a prodigy sensibility to him, and he, and he seems to be self-taught. But I think, you know, all you need to do to make good films is to watch good films. And then watch bad films, too. Get a well-rounded education. You don't, you know, he's not a film school guy. He just not of, at all. Because they didn't really have, like, it wasn't, film school wasn't a glamorous thing back then. You know, it was the era of the filmmaker for a couple more years after that. But still, he just had this ability to be able to light. And I think it's about the lighting more than anything. He did shoot on 35 millimeter because you can tell it just looks really good. It looks so clean. I the, the, the one I watched is not the one I first watched when I watched it on the Sci-Fi Channel. The one I watched on Sci-Fi Channel was kind of beat up looking. This well, yeah, one was really clean. Yeah. It's still, I mean, still, the movie doesn't make any damn sense to me whatsoever because... You see, it doesn't make sense to you. It makes sense to me. I mean, okay, you find out more in the second movie, but the movie, for the most part, makes sense to me. Now, I will not lie to you. The ending, for a few years, confused me, but then I finally understood it. Well, it's like, okay, we start off... First, we start off with... Uh, we got a pre credit sequence where some, some guy's doing this girl in the cemetery, and then she fucking stabs him to death. Turns out to be this guy's friend... <clears throat> And his um and his little brother and they go to the funeral or something. They see a bunch of weird shit involving uh, the tall man Angus Scrim, who that isn't his real name because he was in that movie that you just mentioned, Jim the Jim the World's Greatest. I Jim... think it's like James Rory Guy or something like that. I, is he is he uh is he Scottish in real life or no? He's in, he's American. He's just an American dude. He just sort of looks Scottish, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he's got that build about him. But they gave him the name Angus Scrim, I guess, so that he could like have a residence and people wouldn't go psycho. <laughs> and think that he was the tall guy. I mean, okay, but you take his you take his given name, you want to put that above a marquee yeah. as the tall man. As Angus tall... Scrim Angus Scrim has more of that good stage namey, you know, I'm Angus scary motherfucker Scrim. feel to it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like Bella Lugosi or Boris Karloff or something like that. Yeah, it, or, it sounds like one of those names. Or you know, Kane like Hodder, those... you know. Yeah. Now you're saying that's just cool. Kane Hire, it's his real fucking name too. That's what I love about it. <laughs> so I was asking you before, is this about like alternate dimensions? Because they they go into this oh the this this uh, mortuary or this ma mausoleum ma mausoleum mausoleum yes I, I want to keep saying mausoleum, but yeah. um they go in there and it's just the way it's decorated the production design too it's just fantastic it looks it looks so clean and also there's a very timeless quality to it too as well, even though it's it's kind of got some fun stuff in there that you would only find maybe in 70s filmmaking especially when you have reggie banister the guy with the ponytail and the yeah and he's bald and everything but he plays the guitar and reggie banister also pops up in uh, bubba hotep and i think he also pops up in beastman he, he must be coscarelli's kind of bruce campbell guy he Just is sort of shows he, up well, he, pops, dude, he pops up in everything i need to find him and john dies at the end though He's in it. I believe he is in it. Okay, I need to find him. I saw his name in the in the Wikipedia, and I, I really do want to see John dies at the end because it's got one of my favorite actors ever, Paul Giamatti. Yep. In it, and and that's just really awesome too. On top of that, but I, it's it's really disappointing to me because Coscarelli is so talented. I mean, like he is so much more hands a head above every other filmmaker out there working and it doesn't seem like he works enough because he only does the projects that he wants to do and he doesn't like playing with the studio system there's also maybe the fact that he made phantasm and it it became a big hit maybe it set him up financially for life so he doesn't it's not like he has to you know make movies well, for but, food but the or thing anything. is i think with almost every movie that he's made save for a couple like anything he's done recently he's had to secure outside financing but i know beastmaster that was set up at mgm so they financed that yeah what was the that's other sort one? of left field too i mean that's a left field movie for him because you that would is. assume like you come on yeah yeah you would assume that he would just continue doing horror and even bubba hotep isn't really pure up straight up horror it's more of a kind of a comedy horror 
Yeah, I mean, dude, Coscarelli, let's see, he knew he was never going to be one of them big studio filmmakers. He just wanted – he wanted to do his own thing. He he was smart. He looked at what others tried to do. They failed. He's like, I'm just going to do my own thing. I guess, but the thing is, I mean, like, he's just as talented, I mean, as John Carpenter. It has Phantasm, – Phantasm has a distinctly John Carpenter vibe to it, too. The music is very Carpenter as well. Yes. So you're looking at it, and you're thinking, oh, Halloween. Or you're thinking um, Prince of Darkness, things like that. You know, it, it, it's or the theme to The Exorcist, even. Yeah, yeah. It's and and also, oh, uh, a lot of uh, Dario Argento. You know, Dario Argento yeah. has his own band, The Goblins, and their music sounds a lot like the music from Phantasm. This Phantasm isn't gory though, per se. It's more, I don't know. It's more Sublim- like subliminal. It's science fiction. It feels like science fiction with with all of the weird stuff going on. Yeah, it, it's. it's... What is it? It's science fiction disguised as horror. So what's the idea here? What are we doing? Are we are we take are we killing people and then are we That's what they're basically doing. Like you're they're killing people and then you're after the funeral, you send the body to an alternate dimension where it becomes squished down and becomes your slave and does your bidding. Yeah, so that's why there are these canisters in this room with the two poles there, you know, the thing that Reggie says yeah, it looks like a um, look like a tuning fork or something. Yep. Puts his hands on him or something, and then there's like a doorway that passes through that into another dimension. But right next to that are these canisters, and he and, and the the guy um the uh, who is it Jody? Uh, Jody. He looks inside one of them and he says they're they're all dwarves, <laughs> <laughs> which is like the weirdest thing. To, it's the weirdest observation to make when you're looking at a canister. So we have canisters of slave dwarves or something like that. Yeah, and he just he needs them for his alternate dimension land, and they never say what it's for. <laughs> but the only the only thing you know is that this alien took on the guise of um, a, someone who lived in the town, apparently, because you find out that the character of the tall man he lived there for years and everything like that. Yeah. yeah. So this alien just took on the facade of a funeral home director, basically. Oh, and there's two commonalities between this and Bubba Hotep, and that is these enormous insects that attack people. <laughs> Isn't that weird? I mean, first he chops off the um, the tall man's finger, yeah. puts it in a box, and then he opens the box, and there's a big fucking fly in there or something. Yeah, and didn't you ever know, dude, that fly was too big for the fucking box. Probably, yeah. Well, now, you see, that was the whole thing about Costco. It's like, that's why you knew he was, like, still kind of a beginner, because, like, he did not realize that fly well, was not fit in that fucking box, man. And then there's also the scarab in Bubba Hotep. But the thing is, there are a couple of giveaways to Coscarelli being a bit amateurish because he has a bunch of things have, happen off camera, and then he has characters explaining it later. Yeah. Like, for some reason, they think that the two girls are dead in the truck. They think Reggie's dead in the truck. Reggie pops up. He says, oh, I'm okay. The girls are okay, too. It's like, oh, well, we went, and then they went back in the town, and you don't ever see it, probably because, I guess, either he didn't have enough money to shoot it or he just cut it out. Another thing that... But that's the that's really the only amateur bit, and that's script. That's just a script problem. Well, one part, one element of the script I didn't like was him going to see the psychic. That that That's just, you know, that, that takes me out of the movie a little bit. Like, you're getting a good flow, and then you hit a wall with that scene, and then you got to recover from that scene. You know, so it starts but... off good, you hit a wall, and then it's got to recover at it. I don't mind. This thing moved at a clip. I mean, it was like, it was it was 90 minutes, and it ran at a clip. Try to be me back when i first saw this movie i had i was dying of lyme disease and i had no idea what the fuck was going on and one movie was drifting into the next they had a whole marathon of movies where they showed carnival of souls evil dead suspiria and phantasm and i was like i hadn't seen a lot of these movies i think the only well was that that might have been the first time i saw evil dead too they show phantasm and i'm just totally eating this up and i was a little bit half mad from having a temperature of 105 for like three days <laughs> And I'm trying to watch this, and my mom goes out. I ask her to get me McDonald's, get me anything, because there's something wrong with my taste, my sense of right. taste. And I'm like, just get me any McDonald's, everything off the menu. So she comes back with a whole bunch of stuff from McDonald's, and I'm taking bites of things, and I can't, I can't taste anything. Nothing has any taste, and I'm watching Phantasm, and I'm drinking Gatorade, trying to sweat this thing out because we didn't quite know if it was Lyme disease yet. And Jeez. <laughs> it's still, and and still, it. But there was something about watching this movie and Suspiria, too, I might add, that sort of with that in combination with my Lyme disease made the viewing experience that much pleasurable because everything scared the hell out of me, even even though it was on sci fi and it was could chop the ribbons. But still, see, with me, man, I ain't gonna lie. I didn't like this movie the first time I saw it. I mean, why why would you say that? Okay, 
you had Lyme disease that basically helped you get the movie. Mm. When I first saw it, I was young, dumb, naive. I didn't know anything about anything. I watch it and I'm like, huh? <laughs> what did I? Uh, I'm like, huh? You know, you know, couldn't appreciate it. I, I'm, I'm into slasher movies. You know what I mean? Like, you're a kid. You're into slasher movies. You're not ready for this kind of horror. Well, there's plenty of slashy stuff in the movie. Well, I mean, but it has. And also, you got the flying ball, sto- the flying ball with a blade, and it sucks yeah. the blood right out of you, and it just shoots out all over the place. Pretty good effect too, by the way. I just wasn't ready for it. But then, you know, a couple years, you know, a couple years go by, taste, taste change, this and that, and I discovered it again, and then I liked it the second time. I really, and now I love the Phantasm series. I mean, I think it's a great series as a whole. Well, it's the same thing as with Carpenter. Like he, all he did was take a sla- make a slasher movie about killing babysitters, right, on Halloween. But it had a, it had a level of professionalism to it that it, it rivaled and competed with m- bigger movies at the time. This does the same thing. It's the same thing. It's how it looks. You could take this movie or Halloween and totally destroy them just with incompetence when you're making this movie. Mm-hmm. But they did a, uh, both of them did a fine job on this. Exactly. I mean, Carpenter and Coscarelli coming out at the same time, it just... It was just one of those things, you know, the right moment. Yeah, but the thing is, I mean, like, Coscarelli has has a very short CV compared to um, Oh, Carpenter's. I know. And that's, that's, that's the more, most disappointing aspect, because this guy has an ear for horror. He has an ear for, for science fiction, pulp, adventure, fantasy, and comedy, you know? And, and he's got a and, photographer's eye, too, on top of that. Yeah, yeah. You just wish he would just be a hired gun, you know, just do big studio pictures. You wish he would do something like that. He could. But, this guy This guy should be making Marvel movies, you know? Yeah, he could make a Marvel movie. But I mean, Sam prob- Raimi made a Marvel movie, for Christ's sake. Well, yeah, I think I think the problem is, like, people people like that, and like John Carpenter, and uh, John Landis also, is that they're afraid, or Terry Gilliam is another example, too. Studios are afraid that these directors will take the movie into their own hands and try to craft their own vision. Mm. And they don't want that. They want they want a filmmaker who just says yes. These days, yes. A couple of filmmakers can still get away with it, but these days, yes. Before we move on to Bubba Hotep, um, any final words about Phantasm there? I'm just mad that it took me a long time to appreciate it for what it was, and I probably could have enjoyed it a lot more when I was a kid if I was smarter. I forgot to mention the performances are really good too. These are yeah, the, especially the kid, the kid in it, you know, um, a Michael Baldwin. Yeah. He's he's wonderful in it. Every, everybody's really good in this movie. It's like the, uh, the again, this is where I have a problem. The psychics. That's the one that's the bad acting. The fortune tellers? Yeah, the fortune tellers. The, the weird uh well, it's it's like this uh blonde girl and she but well that see the thing is I didn't have a problem with it because it reminded me of Carnival, which was this really good show on HBO and there was a there was a psychic and um and she she communicated telepathically only to her daughter or yeah to her daughter and her daughter would relay the message that's why i i didn't bug me as much as it bugged you i guess i mean but that act that acting but everyone else's acting was really good reggie's freaking bill thornberry's a michael baldwin angus scrim yeah yeah He's re- for, for for all intents for people who were damn near in their first movies you know working for no money with no studio or nothing, they all did a, an amazing job. That's because, you know what, I bet you Coscarelli, he did it guerrilla style. I don't even know if he got permits. He was just like, I got a camera, I'm, I wrote a script, let's get out there, let's make a horror movie. You know, like kind of like what Sam Raimi did with Evil Dead, the first yep. one. All right, let's move on to Bubba Hotel. Another non-studio film, even though MGM owns it, I mean, they didn't own it originally. This one was... Um... Well, it was a it was, it was a small movie. I mean, it had a million dollar budget, but again, a million dollars in two thousand two is probably equivalent to three hundred thousand dollars in nineteen seventy nine. So it's still yeah. kind of a, low a no budget. money a no money movie. And also, I mean, like the location, the primary location looks like the very much like the primary location from Phantasm. If it isn't already, maybe it's Don Coscarelli's house for all we know. Well, knowing him, I know he has a lot of friends in the business, so he probably found an abandoned hospital someplace and he shot it there. And it probably didn't cost him anything to rent the property. Right. Uh, now, this is uh, this is the pairing that you always wished for, where you had, like, Don Coscarelli directing and Bruce Campbell, of all people, playing Elvis. And Bruce Campbell really does a fantastic job. This is – actually, you know, there's a lot about Bubba Hotep. There's a lot of stuff in there that's obviously – it gets a hard R. But the dialogue and the storyline 
which comes from a, a short story um, by Joe R. Lansdale, who I know because I have a cup. I have a, uh, I have a book, and it's probably down in the basement. But it's a bunch of short stories around the character of Batman and Bruce Wayne, and they're written by it's they're written by famous writers, uh, among them Stephen King and people like that. I think maybe even Clive Barker. Uh, but there's a story in there by Joe R. Lansdale as well, and he wrote so he wrote part of this for this. Uh, I think it was an anthology of Batman stories. Uh, it's a really good one, though. It's a really good uh, collection of stories from really good writers who just, I guess, screwing around writing a story about Batman and it gets published in this collection. <laughs> but it is a lot of fun. And in this, okay, we have to, th there's a couple of suppositions here. There's a couple of ideas that need to be advanced about Bubba Hotep. Okay. And the idea is that Bruce, uh, that I'm sorry, Elvis Presley never died, uh, that he switched places with an Elvis impersonator and pretended to be that Elvis impersonator and signed all his holdings to the Elvis impersonator. And, and he goes into this old folks home and everybody thinks that he's this guy. But you have to believe, you have to believe that he's Elvis Presley. And the thing is, I do. I believe it too. Yeah. I, and also the guy who plays the Elvis impersonator is played by a Bruce Campbell. Mm -hmm. So in, mu in, mu in much younger makeup. Yeah. Yeah. They did. A, oh, man. They did a fantastic job of the makeup on him. And he's supposed to be playing a guy old, much older. Uh, than he than he actually is, and then you have Ozzy Davis, who is his friend, who says he's uh, John F. Kennedy, <laughs> and they dyed him black, they patched him up after the assassination, and then they just left him in the old folks' home. Uh, and they they're a team in this because it, 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 it this is I, I I don't quite know I you know what it kind of reminds me of is Exorcist three. Remember how in Exorcist three <laughs> we spend a little bit of time in a mental institution where yeah. possessed people are just running around and they're also climbing around on the ceilings and stuff. It's very weird in that way. Uh, no one seems to be noticing though. These people are just dropping dead and they're dropping dead and there's there's um there's this uh, beetle or scarab this enormous scarab that's uh, terrorizing people and trying to kill them and all this stuff and they're dropping dead of heart attacks or something that's can be easily explainable by the fact that they're old. Because he's an old mummy that needs old people. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> it has <laughs> it has a phantasm feel to it, too, in that way. Even the way it's shot visually, it has the same kind of visual characteristics as phantasm. Just probably with better sound, I would say. Probably with, you know, Dolby surround and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, obviously not multi-channel. And but... a lot more visual effects, too. Visual effects... Uh, Got a lot of them practical, looking really good. Well, that's because uh, you know he knows K and B. That's right. He, cut, he called in favors. They worked on it for him, I think, for cheap or for free. No, oh, they probably got paid. They they got paid something. Somebody got paid for this. They had to have been. But it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Did you notice the production company? What was that? Silver Sphere Corporation. <laughs> that's the name of the company that produced <laughs> that produced the movie. AKA just Don Coscarelli. So it was well. It was just kind of like I guess I guess it was shot. As a negative pickup and then bought later. So, but at a million dollars, they probably got their money back and then some. The only problem is it wasn't released in that many theaters. But the thing is, I had yeah, heard well, about this movie. Yeah, because it had that. Un well, I heard of it on, on video. I didn't hear of it in the theater or in Fango. I heard about it because I saw a couple of commercials on television because it was, and it played like, you know, Sci Fi Channel and stuff like that. So they, they would run commercials for Bubba Hotep on the Sci-Fi channel, and you'd be like, well, you know, it's Bruce Campbell and everything. And it seems to almost make complete sense to see uh, Bruce Campbell dressed up as Elvis. And then kind of doing a more competent version, I guess, of Ash. <laughs> Except he's Ash, but he's Elvis, and Elvis is, is he's a smart, he's smarter than Ash, but he's just old. So he has a crippling handicap about him, and, but still great physical acting all the way around. Yeah, because he was looking like 44 around that time. So he was still pretty young when he did that role. Yeah, I guess, yeah. So he got, you, you know, you could believe him as an old guy, but then he had some physicality to him when you needed it. He did a great job. It's it's kind of unfortunate that you don't get to hear any Elvis, because Elvis would have been awesome in this movie to hear. Yeah, they they said, I read up on that, like... Uh, There's no this... way. There was no way they were going to license any Elvis songs. They couldn't do that. I, lo I love Ossie Davis in this movie. Ossie now, Davis his... is incredible. He's wonderful. You know he's not Jack Kennedy. You know he's not. You, you know he... he's not, but he's got crazy stories. And the thing is, he's kind of a, I guess he's a conspiracy nut. Call him that, you know? Because he insists yeah. on being called Mr. President, you know? <laughs> There's like this, because he's like, he's like passed out or asleep, and he keeps, and Elvis goes up to him and goes, Jack, Jack? And he goes, Mr. President? And then he gets up, 
you know. But then he, all of a sudden, when he gets up, he doesn't know who Elvis is again. So you he calls know him he's so, got... he, ca- he calls him Sebastian a little bit, and then he calls yeah. him, and then he says the king, you know, and he calls him Elvis. When I first saw the movie, I really loved it. I thought it was great. And then I watched it again, and then I got depressed because I'm getting old. <laughs> so I'm looking at this, and he's talking about how his dick doesn't work anymore, and there's a weird growth on it, and how he has cancer, and nobody's telling him, and he can't do anything. And this nurse is like, I don't know what she's doing. Is she like, is she like um, stimulating him? Or something. Oh, she's rubbing the uh, the goop on that growth on the head of his dick. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's just like, what? Yeah. That scene goes on for a little too long, but it's totally for exposition, so I'll forgive it. I can't, you know what I can't forgive? The really good sound effects. There are too many really good sound effects. There's a lot of... <laughs> stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's just like, oh, God. You know, sound effects are can be a wonderful thing, but if you overdo it, I forget. That whole scene was overdone, oh, though. I was thinking about the uh, the prequel, the Thing prequel. I uh-huh. watched that yesterday. Too many sound effects. Too much Too much scuttling, too much stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, and, and again, if you wouldn't have had all that fucking CGI, you wouldn't have had all them extra sound effects. Yeah, yeah. If it would have been practical like it was supposed to be or like it was shot, then it wouldn't have been so bad. That is what we'll be talking about next time on the show is we'll be talking about the Carpenter thing, the prequel thing, and the Hateful Eight. Because there are parallels. There are parallels. Uh, Tarantino is on record saying that the Hateful Eight is a homage to the thing. So there you go. And also uses some of Ennio Morricone's sa- songs on that. But And it also has Kurt fucking Russell. And Kurt Russell. We're going to find out who's who. So back to Bubba Hotep. They figure out that this mummy... Uh, needs to be killed. I don't know where they came up with the idea, though, to douse it and and set it on fire. Be, uh, they got that from the book. They said, "Oh, they figured out." They go, "Hey, from what I understand, if you burn it, it's it goes away." But it's 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 the whole the movie has this weird uh, kind of vibe of, of folk storytelling or something because a lot of it seems like bullshit. Like Elvis is looking at a stall in the bathroom, and apparently there's some graffiti there that was written by the mummy. Yeah, and that's so. I mean, dude. And that's the title of the episode the, too. Why would by a mummy the way. do that? Why would a mummy do that? It's it's like well, it's the title of the episode as well. Fan, uh, Pharaoh gobbles donkey goobers. That's one of the things he wrote on the wall, and that's the title of this episode. Also, something about Cleopatra doing something. I forget what it was. <laughs> something nasty about Cleopatra. And then the two of them, they get they dress up. He dresses up in his um, co- concert outfit. He dresses up in a nice suit. Gets into his wheelchair. Jack Kennedy. They go out there. They try to attack the mummy. The mummy gets JFK. And then Elvis decides to be a hero. And he and and this is the thing I've always loved about Bruce Campbell. He just he he makes it work. Nobody I don't think anybody else could play this part. I can't maybe Nicolas Cage. I don't know. <laughs> but Oh, not around that not around that time. Shit. But it's just you think of Nicolas Cage, you, you know, think about him in Wild at Heart, or you think about him in that horrible what was that? Honeymoon in Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> You know, he does this sort of uh, thing where he's always like that all the time. Come on yeah, over here, he, Bubba uh, Hotel. Uh, but he would have overplayed it there, hound dog. He would have overplayed it because all he does is live. <laughs> exactly. He would have he would have overplayed the fuck out of that, man. But uh, Bruce Campbell represents a lot of clout. He did it with a quiet restraint. That's what I loved about Bruce. He did it with a quiet restraint. Yeah. and Like, he played it so perfectly. Like, he didn't overdo it. You know, every in joke, especially if you're an Elvis fan and you know everything, when he talks about Colonel Tom Parker's so I should have dumped his ass a long time ago. <laughs> and then he talks about how Priscilla was the love of his life and he wished he could talk to his daughter. I, I, I wanted to cry. And there's there was a moment there at the end of the movie where I did shed a tear because I felt like there was some – this could have been such a bigger movie than it was when it was released. It should have been. This movie should have been in 3,000 theaters. It, sh- it would have been an enormous hit. I guarantee it would have been an enormous hit. It, it, it's got a total cr- crowd-pleasing vibe to it. It could have gotten nominations for Oscars and such. It was such a well-made piece of film. Yeah, well, unfortunately, Coscarelli didn't feel like taking it to a studio and wanted to do it his own way. <sighs> but it was better I than mean, Forrest you, Gump. you got you to you understand, <laughs> he got... Bruce Campbell, so Bruce Campbell. Wait a minute, what are we talking about here? Kurt Russell played Elvis in in a movie directed by John Carpenter, remember? Yeah, he could have gotten Kurt Russell. He could have gotten fucking Kurt Russell, too. But, you know, it's Bruce Campbell. What are you going to do? But then Kurt Russell went on to play Elvis a couple years later, or right around the same time, 3,000 Miles to Graceland. That's right, yeah. And also, I think David Keith played him, too, in a movie where he said, I want a cheeseburger. 
Oh, yeah, I want. Oh, Heartbreak Hotel. Heartbreak Hotel. I want a cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. <laughs> and then we could also have, uh, what is it? Uh, I think it's Val Kilmer's Elvis from True Romance. Yeah, yeah. But you can like, barely see him in the movie. I love Clarence. Always have. Always, always will. Have. Always will. <laughs> when he, fi- oh, uh, he finally kills Bubba, uh, the Bubba Hotel, if you will. And then he looks up in the sky, and the sky forms uh, those oh, yeah. hieroglyphs, and it says, all is well. And then he dies. It's just, wow. That is such like a that is such a best picture goes to moment right there. Which is which, wonderful. Which, which if it were like, dude, I get, I get what you're saying. If this were like a $20 million movie, how much better it could have looked, how much better the effects could have been. But then you also figure how much of how much worse could it have been if it had that kind of. Well, I mean, think about it. $20 million, $20 million in 2002. You could have licensed a couple of Elvis songs, maybe. You could have maybe had a, a a prologue that took place in Egypt instead of that newsreel footage or whatever it was. Yep. You could have had a bigger battle uh, instead of the mano a mano thing that happens. You could have retained the best elements of the story. The story is what really rocks in this movie is it's so fucking clever. And it's so much more clever than anything being made. But then no. But then you got to figure no studio wanted to touch it, so he had. Why to do it though? I don't understand. This thing sells itself. It's just that. Well, maybe there's a studio hatred of Bruce Campbell. I do know that because every time they ever tried to get Bruce Campbell, like Sam Raimi, tried to get Bruce Campbell uh, as the star of um, Dark Man. Well, not only Dark Man, but also this movie that he did after Evil Dead called Crime Wave. And oh yeah, they couldn't get him. Uh, the, the studio. Didn't want they wanted Reed Burning because they thought Reed Burning would would sell, uh, would put asses in seats. So they cast Bruce Campbell's Ronaldo the Heel, um, and he's probably the best thing about the movie actually. And uh, the movie flopped. It's completely tanked, and you know, Raimi had to compromise quite a bit just to make this movie because it was being made without his money. So right. he had to do so. And, and so every time you find Bruce Campbell in these small roles, he's at the end of Darkman, of course. He has a very small little part. Blink and you'll miss him in Simple Plan. Uh, yeah, he's not in a picture, isn't he? I don't even know if he's in a picture. He might be like in a wide shot somewhere running away in the snow. And then there's also he has a very small part in Spider-Man and in Spider-Man 2. And in Spider-Man 3. Yeah, yeah. And he just sort of pop- and he pops up in Coen Brothers movies, too. Remember, he was in a... That stupid uh, Hud, Hud Sucker Proxy. Well, yeah, he was in Hud Sucker Proxy, kind of a bigger part, but he was in Fargo too, in a soap opera that the bad guys were watching. Yeah. Remember? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's brilliant. I mean, but you put Bruce Campbell, you try to get him anywhere you can. The only time they ever accepted him in a major role was in Army of Darkness. Yeah, but that was De Laurentiis's money. Yeah, yeah. But nobody said, well, no, you can't have. Well, actually, no, I did. I think they did try to replace Bruce Campbell, but Raimi backed them up. It was like, no, this is Ash. You can't do that. Uh, he's such see, a, and, and he's the, such and a great why, hero. And this is why Coscarelli's smart. He didn't want to, He doesn't like playing with the studio systems. He doesn't want to. I guess, but he could do so much. He could do so much if he was with the right people, you know? Well, I mean, the one reason I know he doesn't want to is because, like, uh, you know, the only movie he doesn't own is Phantasm 2. That is the only thing he's made that doesn't belong. That's to him. owned outright by Universal. One hundred percent by Universal. They don't. They will never give it back to him. It he got really. I, I. You know what the thing is? I did try to watch Phantasm too. I got the feeling that it was chopped severely. Mm-hmm. It was. There is a. There is a director's cut out there. And they basically he, locked he, him out of the fought, editing room and he, they added like a bunch of stuff that he didn't want added. Yeah, and he fought for a Michael Baldwin, but then he couldn't get him. Mm. They, that's why his his role was replaced. Well, that's why didn't they kind of move everything around? Didn't they move it up a little bit, like in years? Well, yeah, because they had to because it was like a coma thing. Well, what did they have? James Legros playing his part? Yeah, James Legros played Mike. Yeah, a very young James Legros, I might add. Yeah, it was like one of his first roles, I think. I mean, and then, oh man, I mean that's the one thing I hate about it's like while Phantasm Two on a technical level is a very well made film, it it's looks like, it, it's, yeah, it, yeah, that looks like Coscarelli's signature style. He he knows how to do it. He knows how to do it so professionally. That's why when you look at Beastmaster, Beastmaster is very cheesy, but it's very well made. And also Tanya Roberts, get the fuck out of here, all right? <laughs> yeah, there you go, man. I mean, I love Tanya Roberts. My wife hates her, but uh, you know she hates that voice. But she was also yeah. in Sheena and everything. But it was a you know, I mean, Tanya Roberts was like. One of the most beautiful women of her time back in the 80s, you know. Still is as far as I'm concerned. Oh, yeah, damn right. She looks really good for her. She's in her 60s now. Jesus Christ. I remember she was on uh, that 70s show as well, but people and said. She was that, hot. 
Oh, she was hot as fuck in that show, dude. But but I've heard it from so many other people that worked with her that she was really hard to work with. She was like completely temperamental and insane. Yeah, that's probably why they wrote her out. Yeah. And they put in Kari War in a place. But um, now Coscarelli had nothing to do with the sequels, right? Well, no, the um, he did, he did, he did all of them except for Ravager. He was uh, because here's what happened: he was able to do two at Universal and three at Universal, but three went straight to video, didn't go to theaters. Well, no, I and, I only see him as going... director on the first one, though. What's that? I only see him as director on the first one. Oh, you're no, talking. He... About, oh, I'm sorry, you're talking about Phantom. I was talking about Beastmaster. Oh, Beastmaster? No, the other two movies. No, he didn't do those. He had nothing to do with them. But uh, yeah, they made these sequels. Either they asked him to, to, to work on them and he refused, or they didn't ask him at all, right? Well, I think I, he, they had to, he had to get uh, – excuse me. I'm getting a little verklempt. Um, I know they had to ask Talk him. amongst yourselves. <laughs> but at the same time, that project was set up at MGM, so maybe he signed a few things. But then at the same time, he already came out and said he got Beastmaster back. Right. I remember uh, seeing yeah. something about that, about having the uh, – finding uh, finding a, a print or an intermediate yeah, positive. Yeah, they, they did find a print. They did find one. Now, uh, there's another one here uh, that I'd never heard of that he did called Survival Quest. I've heard of that movie. And it's got a killer cast. I mean, it's got Lance Henriksen, Dermot Mulroney, Paul Provenza, the stand-up comedian, Catherine Keener. The, uh, this is ridiculous. Of course, Reggie I Bannister. And I think that one he had set up at MGM, either that or they distributed. I don't know anything about this movie. I have no idea what it's about. Uh, now, did you see John Dies at the End? I love that fucking movie. Uh, that one I haven't seen. Don't ruin that it for is, me. That, but... is, that is naked lunch for the 2000s, dude. But once again, we have a very low-budget movie, and it didn't make any money at the box office. No, didn't make any money. But you know what? It made it made its money on home video. They they did this knowing it was going to find its audience on home video. Oh, that's, that's good. They did it for cheap. But another good cast because you got Paul Giamatti, you got Clancy Brown, you got Doug Jones, and you got Daniel Roebuck. Doug Jones is yes, yeah, he was the guy who was in that fucking fish fucking movie, and he's on S Star Trek Discovery. He was the fish that gets fucked. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> I, I, I prefer to think of him in Hellboy, okay? Yeah, he was in Hellboy. Uh, was that the original? Yeah, that was the original Hellboy. Yeah, Hellboy uh, 1. Well, yeah, he was also in Mimic. Ooh, man, that was back when Guillermo made good movies. Jeez, man. <laughs> I'm sorry, dude. I'm, dude, I haven't seen I have fish no, I'm sorry. Movie. I have no emotional stake in fish fucking, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I am not into weird, deaf chicks with great asses who masturbate in bathtubs and have sex with fish. <laughs> And movies like this win Best Picture, people. Yes, that, that movie won Best Picture. I, she has an egg timer. She masturbates in a bathtub. She's got a great ass, and she fucks a fish. The best so, picture uh, of the so, so basically, you feel about that as much as I do about Bill Paxton in a mesh shirt and leather pants. You turned her into a freak. <laughs> and the and the Oscar goes to Boxing Helena. <sighs> All right. Well, uh, what do you say we wrap this puppy? Yeah, let's wrap it up by saying, Don Coscarelli, if you're out there. Make, make movies. A, make, make, a, make a fucking movie. I don't care what you do. Put, put a camera in somebody's kitchen and have two people arguing for two hours. You are talented. You will, be, you will make a great movie if you do that. It's like, dude, just get fucking Bill Thornberry, Reggie Bannister, Bruce Campbell, and A. Michael Baldwin all up in a room and fucking have it out for three hours. Have them do a circle jerk. <laughs> we will pay. We will pay to see it. Uh, do you think I went too far with the circle jerk? I think you went a little <laughs> too far. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, 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 first, uh, well, before I end this, I want to say uh, that me and John, Mr. Fairlake here, are going to be doing a Van Halen podcast. It's going to be kind of a mini cast where we're going to take an album every every week, I guess, maybe, and and talk about the album and why we like it so much because Van Halen is a is one of the things that we have in common. So amongst that, a lot of other things. Yeah, but you know, I mean, when it comes to music, we can talk about music, and I've never done a music podcast. I'm very excited about this. So um, until then, that'll that'll be out probably in uh, I want to say mid to late November. That'll be out mid to late November of this year. We'll have a either a new president or an old president, and we'll talk about Van Halen. Sounds good to me. All right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Do you think the circle jerk was over the top? Uh, it was over the top, but it worked. Wake up!